Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fausto Rodriguez, and uh, I will be discussing some uh, uh, issues regarding brain tumors from the standpoint of neuropathology, which is my uh, field of practice. So this is an outline of what I'm going to be discussing today. I'm going to be focusing a lot on the WHO classification of brain tumors. This is a standard of classification that it, it is always updated through the years. And that it gives us a terminology for us to be able to discuss the different type of, uh, of tumors that we can encounter in the CNS. And then we're going to be uh, discussing also some of the pathologic features of the major brain tumors, particularly gliomas. So if we look at, uh, at brain tumors in general, and, and just to get a perspective here with these pie charts, we see that uh, some of the most common tumors, you have meningiomas and tumors of the pituitary being uh, important players, but many of these are low-grade neoplasms and, and, and in theory uh, cured by uh, resection. So, but the glioblastoma in particular and other gliomas tend to be um, uh, very problematic because these are a more aggressive neoplasm and, and are highly relevant to the neuro-oncology practice. Uh, so the, the, uh, dividing tumors by age is also very important. I'm gonna briefly touch on the pediatric uh, uh, brain tumors, which you, you start seeing that the distribution uh, shifts and you start getting some other players like low-grade gliomas that, um, that become increasingly important in, in children and young adults, but that are not associated with large morbidity, mortality, but maybe associated with a lot of uh, CNS problems, particularly in, in patients that have a, a longer lifespan. Uh, when we receive a specimen in neuropathology, we, we need to put this in context of the clinical uh, information uh, that we receive from radiology and from our oncologists and surgeons, uh, because different areas of um, the CNS uh, have different a spectrum of, of neoplasms and, and lesions that can af affect it. And it helps us a lot diagnostically. The WHO classification of tumors, as I alluded to, uh, is a, a, the standard that we use for making diagnosis of tumors on the pathologic level. And uh, increase in, for a number of years, it has been based mostly on the histology of what we see under the microscope. But with time, now we know that uh, studies, genetic studies have helped us increase objectivity in, in this diagnosis. And, and there are powerful tools that allows us now to classify it a little bit better. Even tumors that look similar under the microscope might have very different outcome depending on the genetic uh, changes that they have. So we are incorporating now these into our classification schemes. And that's one of the, the new advances that we have in the WHO classification. There's always a variety of new entities, variants, patterns that are uh, discussed. This is just basic terminology that we use. There are tumor types, which are very distinct uh, in, at the clinical and pathologic level, and they are essentially a group on their own. Then you have subtypes within those that are, can be well characterized, and they may have some clinical utility in a sense that some of them might be associated with a worse outcome or a more aggressive behavior or a less aggressive behavior. And we need to recognize those. And then there are what we call patterns in the pathologic jargon, which are uh, features that we see under the microscope, but that may not have too much effect on, on, on patient care. And you may see it in the reports and occasionally they, are, they can be confusing. In the 2007, there was a fourth uh, classification of brain tumors, so, and it was pretty straightforward. There were major categories that haven't, been, haven't changed for a long time, still based on what we see under the microscope, and occasionally with the use of immunohistochemical or special stains. Uh, now, uh, there were the broad group of diffuse gliomas and then the circumscribed gliomas, the latter being tumors that are overrepresented in children and in young adults. In 2016, there were some major changes happening, and, and those changes were the incorporation of specific uh, alterations at the DNA level or mutations that confer a different prognosis. This was very new and was incorporated into the diagnosis of tumors, separating tumors that were more aggressive and, and less aggressive, depending on the specific alteration discussed. So it, it's become more complex in a sense that many of these um, tumor types now are specified depending on the alterations that they have. Given that the WHO classification happens every several years, 
there's something that has happened in the meantime, which is see impact now, which many of the same authors of the WHO or editors, they get together and they start evaluating uh, the ongoing new um, um, uh, information that is obtained and is incorporated in interim recommendations for diagnosis. More recently, this is something that we were waiting for a long time, which was a WHO classification of tumors of the central nervous system, the 2021 um, recommendation, uh, which now is in book form and available online and has refined a lot of the, uh, our diagnostic dilemmas, uh, although not completely. In the past, I'm, I'm gonna show you some historical information from the pathology standpoint that are of value. We have called tumors diffuse astrocytomas or low grade based on the histology for a long time. Again, this has been altered a little bit based on the mo mo morphologic, the molecular genetic features of the tumor itself. Uh, so these are tumors at the lower end of the spectrum that we recognize as low grade because they are not very cellular, but we can still recognize them as tumor as ne having neoplastic astrocytes with not much proliferation. Once we start seeing proliferation, that's something that we don't like on tumors. And we see it at the, in the microscope as mitosis. These are uh, provide a, uh, these tend to be tumors that are more proliferative and that uh, are uh, for us, more worrisome for, for aggressive behavior. And then we have tumors that have, in addition to those features, necrosis. And that's what uh, uh, really is one of the main characteristics of glioblastoma, which is one of the highest grade uh, or more aggressive tumors that can be encountered in the brain and in the body. So with time, we have a recognized markers that kind of have allowed us to separate many of these tumors into more uh, prognostically or categories, of, as I mentioned, that are useful for uh, monitoring their behavior. One of them, these are the IDH1 mutation, which when present in a diffuse glioma in an adult, it provides a more uh, favorable prognosis. And that has been incorporated in the classification of tumors. There's a spectrum of grades two, three, and four. The WHO classified tumors in, in a spectrum of four groups of, of grades, one, two, three, and four, with more aggressiveness noted in the higher, in the, at the upper uh, level of the spectrum. Many of the diffuse gliomas that occur in adults uh, start at grade two, since grade one are tumors that are considered probably curable by resection, but many of these are not. They are manageable, but not, uh, they, uh, they require oftentimes other treatments, or they eventually end up many times progressing to higher grades. And we're starting to incorporate not only our morphology, but we're incorporating our uh, molecular uh, information or genetic information into them for this grading. Um, so glioblastoma, again, is the highest, is grade four by definition, and it lacks by definition also this alteration in IDH1 or IDH2. And uh, this is what it looks like. It's characterized by a large masses that have necrosis that can be uh, identified on, at the radiologic level. Another issue that we need to have into, in mind when looking at pathologic specimens is rep tissue representation, because sometimes you have larger masses and in the brain is very difficult sometimes, depending on where the tumor is, to obtain a, a, a lot of material uh, without causing a lot of injury. So sometimes we may have smaller biopsies that occur from the edge of the tumor, and we end up seeing uh, in, in, information uh, that allows us to put it in a low grade in the histology. This is being uh, increasingly superseded by genetic analysis because the genetic alterations are usually more um, spread through other tumors. So even if in small pieces of tumor, sometimes if you have enough material for processing, you can get a precise characterization with molecular findings. Sometimes we have these stereotactic biopsies, very small, but you can provide a lot of information. And we uh, do smears and, um, and, and processing for those. We can look at this while, they, while they, uh, there is an operation happening. We many times end up uh, evaluating a piece to give a, the surgeon some information about a preliminary of what the tumor may be in the general category that it belongs. Uh, to help with management. And this is what the, the gliomas look like in a, in a cytologic smear. They have all these processes, these larger cells. They have, uh, you can start seeing mitotic activity. Uh, those are uh, features that we associate with some of the higher grade tumors like glioblastoma. Um, there are many different molecular techniques that allow us to also classify tumors. One of them is FISH or inside the hybridization. These are tumor nuclei with amplification, a lot of gain of this gene, EGFR, which is, is uh, something that occurs frequently in this tumor. 
Uh, more recently, uh, there has been these gene panels by sequencing or next generation sequencing. NGS is a terminal term that you may hear a lot about uh, and in which there's a lot of conjunction, uh, sequencing of many multiple genes simultaneously. And we can see a lot of uh, uh, alteration. We can look at the amplifications and gains of different chromosomes and gene sequencing allows you, for, is used for classification because these alterations are very typical of glioblastomas. It helps us as pathologists to be able to classify the tumor, but it also can identify uh, genes that can be targeted with special agents that are now being tried in, in clinical trials. Another subtype of glioma is oligoendoglioma uh, that um, has been known historically as a diffuse glioma that has a better prognosis than other tumors in, uh, and increase uh, sensitivity to treatment. This is what they look like. They are not as ugly looking, we may say, uh, in the histologic level uh, compared to glioblastomas. They tend to have these very uh, delicate round cells. Um, that's how we identify it on the histology, round cell with round nuclei. Uh, but at the molecular level, something that is very characteristic is this 1P19Q correlation in addition to the IDH mutation. And in the group of diffuse gliomas that affect adults, it's the group of tumors that probably is associated with a better prognosis. And we look for those features uh, at multiple levels when we study. Uh, these are some of the historic studies that have highlighted a better outcome for these tumors in, um, uh, compared to the glioblastomas or the high other uh, astrocytic neoplasms. You can test for this 1P19Q alteration again by different type of molecular findings by FISH, which is in situ hybridization, by other molecular uh, ways of looking at the chromosomes, and more recently, again, by uh, next generation sequencing, which gives you uh, a lot of powerful information. And here you can see the loss of the 1P arm and the 19Q arm, which is typical of these uh, oligondogliomas, uh, in, uh, which result from a genetic alteration, what we call a, a translocation. Pediatric gliomas are uh, another group of tumors that, um, that for a long time we used to classify them very similarly to the adult tumors because histologically some of them look very similar, but we have learned that, uh, that they are biologically a little bit different. And they have also a wider spectrum of tumors. These are pleomorphic xanthoastrocytomas, pilocytic astrocytomas, and gangogliomas. So there's a variety of tumors that can, that are over, I will say overrepresented in the pediatric population and in young adults com compared to the older adults. So, and these are some of the pathologic features. Pilocytic astrocytomas, they are grade one. So in, in theory, depending on the anatomic location, they can be uh, completely resected. Uh, it's the most common uh, type of childhood glioma and um, can be uh, encountered in, across the CNS. These are some of the cytologic features. You have all these bright processes. These are tumor processes, the tumor cells making these, uh, these processes. They tend to have what we call this biphasic uh, type of appearance, areas that are compact, areas that have a lot of microcysts or little holes. And at the genetic level, they also have uh, a lot of alterations, particularly in a gene called BRAF, um, that um, explains some of the biology. And we test for these in, in some of these epidemic tumors. Uh, in addition to these circumscribed or more uh, curable uh, tumors that you see in the pediatric population, there's also something called diffuse gliomas that occur in children. And in the past, again, we used to classify them similarly to what we classify the tumors in adults, but now we know that biologically they are distinct uh, and they have a distinct genetic profile. Um, some of them have alterations in, in genes, in several genes. One of them is this called MIB, M-Y-B. Um, so these are frequent in pediatrics, but not so much in adults. So the, the composition, the genetic makeup, and, and the biology of these tumors is, is very different in, in children compared to, even if they, they look essentially the same in the microscope. And this is also something that is very new in our WHO classifications. There are tumors that look a bit like oligondogliomas um, in, in children, very similar at the histologic level uh, as the oligondogliomas that occur in adults, but they are considered different type of tumors. So they are more com com considered diffuse gliomas, pediatric diffuse gliomas, and they have, again, different type of uh, genetic alterations and outcome. There are very new categories. This is evolving all the time. Uh, this is sounds like a mouthful, but um, uh, plenty. Uh, these are tumors that 
you look at them and you try to put them in one of those more uh, conventional categories, but the genetic makeup may uh, separate them into a specific category. Uh, some of these are low grade, like this one, and they have a specific alterations like um, uh, in gene fusions that explain their biology. And these are this list actually is increasing in some ways. These tend to be more rare, of course, compared to the more conventional uh, glioblastomas or IDH mutant gliomas. There is also this group of high-grade gliomas that occur in children. Some of them uh, historically have been called and that occur in the brain stem. They are very aggressive neoplasms that for a long time were not even biopsied because of the location. Uh, now we know that independent of the histologic grade, many of these do very poorly. They can look like other gliomas that occur in, in, in the brain, uh, but they tend to have a specific alterations, as I mentioned. And one of them is this uh, mutation in a histone gene that confers it a very aggressive uh, prognosis. And we can identify this with some special stains that we have in our um, laboratories. Um, then there is also a group of tumors that occur in very young patients, and these are infantile gliomas that tend to have also some specific gene alterations that are different. So the specifics here are not as uh, re as important really in the genes uh, for the purposes of this discussion, but the, the idea is to make, uh, to, 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 that I want to convey is that you have different genetic alterations in these tumors, depending on age and depending on, on groups that can uh, start uh, starting to drive treatment in, in clinical trials. This is, for example, a pediatric glioma that has an NTRK fusion, which uh, there are specific drugs that can uh, be uh, can target those. So uh, this is a group of diffuse gliomas, again, in the most recent WHO 2001. Again, the, the details are not specific. It's just that we want to convey that they are different from the ones that occur in adults. So in conclusion, um, uh, we are starting now to use these integrated reports that have phenotypic, and by that mean the histologic information that we see from the microscope, uh, and then also genetics based on by various sequencing uh, technologies that are increasing our objectivity in diagnosis and giving us a common language that we can use to communicate with, uh, with patients, uh, uh, oncology surgeons and uh, basic researchers to uh, um, increase our approaches, uh, a more a better approach, more um, uh, approach to the management of, of patients with brain tumors. And it's giving us um, a lot of information and understanding of the biology of these tumors that we're really hoping it translates into uh, much better treatments. Uh, it has become increasingly complex, and uh, unfortunately, but uh, it has it, it has a lot of benefits um, and has clarified a lot of um, different uh, groups of of neoplasm of tumors. And I will leave it open uh, for any questions uh, when we are we meet in person. Thank you.